everyone. I'm Julie Gunlock, your host for another episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. For those new to the program, this podcast is focused on how parents should custom tailor their parenting style to fit what's best for their families, themselves, and most importantly, their kids. So many people have heard me tell my own story of having to scramble when my school closed and didn't reopen. It still hasn't really reopened. Um, They are allowing kids in two times a week, fully masked. Um, But when those kids get back into the classroom, they still stare at their computer because their teacher is still conducting Zoom school with the kids that have decided to stay home. So really not much has changed. They certainly are not back to regular school. When it happened, I I decided to pull two of my kids out, as I've talked about on this program. And when I say out, I chose to pull them out of the public schools and I had to get creative. And so have many other parents. Today, I have a really special guest on. Allie is the mother of four. We've decided to keep Allie's full name and location private due to concerns she has, and I think a lot of other parents have, about speaking publicly and critically about her public school. So just a little bit of background. When Allie's Children's Public School closed last year, they started with the pan- with the virtual school system that her public school had set up. We call it Zoom school. But she went ahead and tried it. So for a couple months in the, in the spring, they were all doing the virtual school system, again, through her public school. By the fall, um, she realized that her kids needed something different. So she joined with other families in her neighborhood that were also concerned about problems that they've been seeing with the virtual school system, and they formed a pandemic pod for all of her children. And this was a really creative solution, and we're going to talk about that today. Allie is here to talk about that pandemic pod and also answer some questions about what it's like to essentially run a mini school for not just your own children, uh, but for other children. So, Ali, thanks so much for coming on with us today. Thanks for having me. So, Ali, you did actually produce, we did a pandemic learning story on you through IWF, and everybody can read Ali's story. If you go to IWF, you'll see the section on pandemic learning, and we have a whole bunch of really fascinating, fabulous first-person stories stories about what parents have done, um, you know, really creative stories about how parents have sort of dealt with uh, schooling their children during the pandemic. And Allie is one of those featured stories. So you can read more. But, you know, Allie, I first want to want you to just answer a really basic question. What is a pod? What's a learning pod? Yeah, so for us, we pulled out of the, the district, and then we signed PSA forms that says that we're homeschooling individually, and then we're basically yeah. all homeschooling together, and we just outsource the main subjects to our teacher, who's amazing. So we are, for us, we have the age groups all separated, so we have in our garage, and we kind of converted that space. And so we're doing a pre-K pod in our garage taught by me and our nanny combined. And then um, down the street, my parents own a home and they live in Texas. So they've allowed us to kind of transform that space into a little, like a mini school. And so we put up a whiteboard and desks and um, that's where our first and fourth graders learn together out of. So we have first grade in the morning and then they leave and then fourth grade comes in the mid afternoon. So for us, it's just four kids to one teacher, um, and we picked all the curriculum, and it's kind of like an efficient school day, um, and they're just doing it together in a small group setting. So, so many questions, because one thing that I think is really interesting, and, you know, I don't quite know know where to start, but space is really important um, in these situations. I I have three children at home. And they're all in a different type of learning format. One of my children is doing, he's actually doing an an entire, uh, a school that's entirely virtual. It's a Catholic school that's all virtual. Um, And we can get into that a little bit later, but, um, and why we chose a Catholic virtual school. But um, my, and then I have one still in the public schools and he's leaving at the end of this year. And then I'm homeschooling one of my children. And so, um, 
but in any format, you know, when you have three kids at home, you, <laughs> um, it, space is so, so important. And certainly if you're going to have a neighborhood pod, um, having that extra space is so important. Um, you're so lucky that you have that extra house that your parents have, have allowed you to, to put that up. But what are the things, what were like some of the supplies that you needed um, when you first got started? Because you really are, I think you're probably like me, didn't really realize everything that you needed. So what did, what were some of the things that were like, you know, oh my gosh, we need to, yeah. you know, this supply and up. I, I think the, gar- the garage space is probably one that could be implemented more easily, obviously, by somebody that doesn't have like a home sitting down the street that they can utilize. But um, so, I mean, that one in, in, in particular, we basically just bought those little foamy square things that go together and covered our floor. I got, I hung up sheets over the garage looking things. Yeah. We, like, put our bikes up on the wall. We just organized it. I got a yeah. freestanding whiteboard. I got bookcases for my Kia to put our materials in. Um, you know, I got, like, their dress-up rack and their, like, Lego bins and stuff. And it, it looks – and then two little tables. Then we got used some, you know, just cheap but, but right. quality, good enough quality for – for the kids. Um, and so the garage space has actually been totally functional and great for the, the pre-K. And then, I mean, the other school just, we just went a little more, um, you know, we took out my parents' furniture and half the side of the room and got a rug desk. Um, but yeah. some of the materials, like the curriculum, um, those things, we split the cost, um, with the other parents. So, um, yeah, curriculum. Can I, can I ask? Supplies. That was another question. Curriculum is a big part of this. And, you know, a lot of people kind of do it themselves. And I am not that person. I am using a curriculum that sort of comes as a package. And I have a curriculum guide. And I have all the teacher's manuals that it all comes together. Did you choose a sort of curriculum company? And I'd love to hear which one you chose. But did you use one that's so, sort of yeah, a school did, in a box? We did. Uh, I did a homeschool boot camp and one of the other parents did it as well. And she kind of went over like high level education philosophies, Charlotte Mason, classical, traditional, kind of to help me understand what type of curriculum and like how I wanted my kids to learn. And I think it also gave me more confidence as a parent that, okay, there are a lot of different ways to educate and, you know, the, the, a group sits down and makes standards based on what they think they want your kids to learn. And I agree with a lot of the standards and we're keeping our eye on all the California standards so the kids can re-enroll at any time, um, you know, in any school setting, but um, it did just give me more confidence. And she also acts as a curriculum consultant. Um, And then I was also given some other websites to look at like, Timber Noodle or Timber Doodle has like curriculum packs um, and apologia. I mean, we're a Christian family, so there are right. some Christian resources that I found that I really like. Um, and then there are other ones that we just use that our teacher had taught with um, at her school. So we kind of did a combo of um, I utilized some, you know, curriculums recommended by the curriculum consultant who does this homeschool boot camp. Yeah, um, and then a combo of what I found and what my teacher found, and brought in the Tuttle Twins books and oh, other things that Twins. I wanted them to learn. I know, That's great free market of, principles yeah. at an early age, excellent yes. work. Yeah, you know, I but know. I think I think and what you're talking about here, though, I mean, I think you know, I, I hear you talking about okay, we use garage space. You know, luckily my parents have a house down the road, where we're able to use that. But the point is, is to be creative. And the point is also is like, there's not one size yeah. fits all, right? So you, you know, yeah. you made the garage kind of less distracting by putting up the sheets. But I feel like even for people, like so let's say you live in a tiny house and you don't have a garage. Okay, that would be me. Okay. <laughs> so um, get, you know, spend, you know, look, I think, I think the other thing with, with pods is that you don't, it doesn't always have to be at your house. Like if you have neighbors that you're sharing with, it sounds like you have kind of an ideal situation, but like if you have a, if you decide to do this potting with other parents and there is a teacher, like on Mondays and Wednesdays, the teacher goes one place on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. I mean, you get it, you can alternate. And that does give you a little bit of sort of downtime. But the other thing is, is for, now I don't, I I never, I want to be very careful on this and never say, oh, just for, you know, $300 or $500, but for a far less amount of money than adding onto your house or, you know, 
moaning about, you can buy a tent, you know, one of those large tents. And so on days where the weather allows, you know, not a 90 degree day with 100% humidity maybe, or, but like on cooler days in the fall and the spring and the early summer, you certainly can use outdoor space. And that's what's so great about, you know, potting or homeschooling or doing whatever, you, you know, micro school is the amount of flexibility that parents have. Um, you oh, know, is that, and for you outdoor space, might be easier to come by for us garage spaces because we're like nobody has a plot of land outdoors See, it's beyond their home so so you're well, like we yeah. got outdoor space I'm like outdoor space that would be great what's we that garage. <laughs> well don't yeah, I won't, sorry, I won't tell ahead. you I'm really happy that we have a yard but my husband is like he he has these personal goals where he says, you know, before the age of X, I am going to have a garage. He just, you know, I feel like okay. he feels like he's he's missing out on some sort of man like test that he doesn't have. You know, Got it's it. very sad. Um, so, you know, I I, I want to just put a plug in. We use Memoria Press. Um, is It is a Christian based um, curriculum as well. And that was another thing that I loved. You know, my children have been going to the public schools for so long and you know, it is, you know, look, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, we, we don't have to sort of relitigate, you know, whether Christianity should be in the schools. I, we, it's only a one hour podcast yeah. after all, but um, it is just the, 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 even around Christmas, you know, there's just, you know, there's such nervousness about in any way uh, there being a religious tone to anything. I remember going in and, and I brought a book to read to my, um, my son's class. And it happened to be a Christian book. And I could tell the teacher was very nervous about that. So that's one thing that's also nice for, and, and part of the flexibility oh. is being able to integrate these Christian concepts into learning. Um, and, and it's a part of learning and you, and, and that's, to me, that's the way it should be. So it's really nice to be able to choose, but for people who don't want that, you know, there are some people who, are not religious and they might want a secular, more secular based curriculum there. They, they have those as well. So don't feel like you have to be part of a Christian homeschool community or like, you know, or a Catholic homeschool community. There's yeah. really something for everyone out there. So. Just and, to- and I think the misconception about homeschooling too, is that, it, I mean, and people say, Oh, you're homeschooling this year. And I'm kind of like, what does it feel like homeschooling? Cause we have teachers, we have, That's right. you know, but it, because my impression and frankly like that that model of like all the kids learning just with me under our one roof I mean that wouldn't work for my four kids especially my you know one of mine that just really needs the structure and it doesn't come quite as easily and so um yeah there's definitely like a variety of models and I do think a lot of homeschool you know homeschoolers end up getting in these co-op kind of groups so they have peers and and in that experience as well. Well, what would be also really uh, what's exciting is I think that there's now this newfound interest in homeschooling. So I hope the communities grow Mm -hmm. because if they grow, then there'll be more partnerships like this. You mentioned, you know, this doesn't feel like homeschooling to me, which it kind of is. I mean, we, we call it, you know, pandemic pod learning or, you know, having a micro school is what you, you've kind of set up, but you know, ultimately you're using homeschool materials and you're creating it yourself. And so, I too am, I'm homeschooling my oldest child. And I really like what you say, because I think there's a lot of working parents out there who think, okay, well, no, I can't do it because I work. Well, I actually work a full-time job. That's, that, that's why I'm on this podcast right now. <laughs> this is actually hosted by IWF, my employer. And so, um, and, you know, IWF is very, that offers enormous flexibility where most of us who work at IWF are moms. And so we sort of get the the, the fl- that we need flexibility. But, you know, I think what a lot of people who are in this situation who might particularly have older kids, um, you know, maybe middle, you know, second year, middle, middle school to high school, a lot of these kids can do things on their own. And really, we should be, mm-hmm. we should be working towards that, where even as you're a homeschooling mom, 
I don't want to hover over my 15 year old. He should be able, and I have a 14 year old that I'm homeschooling right now. He just turned 14 and I am trying to get him to do more and more things on his own and, and to sort of complete tasks on his own. And that's really the goal. So I think for a lot of people, you know, I know, I understand that if you, if you don't work at home, I mean, first of all, if you work period, but then there are some people who work at home where it's easier. Um, but you know, for older kids, I think it really is possible um, to, to do a sort of situation where, you know, maybe, um, they're required to do certain things during the day. And then you, you know, at night, maybe you check things or you work with them or you help them with certain topics, obviously. But the other thing you mentioned, and I love this, like, you know, you have a teacher and I have a tutor. And so I have a tutor who comes in and and teaches him, um, you know, I, my son is doing algebra. I can't really do long division. So <laughs> obviously a tutor was an answer there. There's also a lot of online yeah. courses. So if you feel like, okay, I don't mm-hmm. want to teach my, my child algebra or chemistry or whatever, there's a lot, very, very inexpensive, very affordable, um, online courses. So I think it's so great to hear, like you say, okay, you know, we're in it with other families, but we've, we've also hired help to do it. And I think sometimes people think that that's just economically yeah. impossible. It's much more available to people than I think people realize. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, you pulled your kids out. Um, you have a pandemic pod. You know, we need to stop calling it that. We need to think of a nicer name. You should, you guys should like pick a, you know, a, you know, an actual name for your little school, but and maybe you have, but, um, what is like? What is it like in your community? Ha- have you seen more of this? Are people leaving the public schools? Are they sort of waking up to the idea of school choice? Because ultimately, let's remember, everybody should be able to do what we're doing, right? That, what, that would be wonderful if yes. everyone could do what we're doing. Um, what is your community being like? And I know, you know, we want to keep you anonymous, but tell us a little yeah. bit about like, is, are you the total oddball? Are you the, are you the one who's doing this and no one else is? What's it been like? Well, I think there were a number of pods. It's interesting because I talked to a, a homeschool consultant that was referred to me here locally as well. And she, she was interested how we made it successful because there were a number that kind of crashed and burned. Um, it, it, because it is, uh, there are a lot of interpersonal dynamics, you know, and so finding like the right teacher and the right families that have similar right. goals and that's all important. Um, but also there, there are some other that did the, that did, did the same thing where they pulled out and they hired a teacher and the, the two pods that I know of that did that, both of them, um, have kids that want to continue in this model. So I think it's been an opportunity. I mean, it's, the alternative didn't work for us. So it's kind of like, why not experiment? What better year, you know, and what right. better opportunity where you have other families where the, the online model isn't working for them either, especially learning to read and write because I have a younger um, where that just is a lot on the parent and I had a newborn yeah. baby, you know. So, yeah. um, but we've also seen, because I, I, I am in California, so we've seen a lot of people maybe leaving the state for other yeah. states that have um, schools that are more functioning as normal. Um, and then we've also seen like a huge shift to private. There's a, a lot of um, ki- kids leaving the public school in general because it's still not, you know, fully open. And yeah. um, private schools have wait lists. So that's yeah. the other thing too is that, you know, there's, I think there will have to be kind of some innovation around around it um but I do think that for us it was a blessing in disguise because it just opened our eyes to think outside of the box and now that we've had the experience of our kids thriving and loving this model I think it's a a bigger risk for someone who hasn't you know experienced or tasted what it could be like because I think there is some security it seems like some families find and just especially if you don't have an education background, which I do thankfully have my credential, not that it's needed, but right. it's interesting because a, fr- a friend pointed out that those that have education backgrounds seemed like they were uh, felt more comfortable pulling initially and just like, it's okay. We can pull out of this system and it's well, right. going to do fine and we're not going to get lost in the, or, or not going to have holes or gaps. But I think anybody can, I think every, you know, everyone should evaluate what's right for their family and and you don't need a credential by any means yeah, I'm glad but it's it. just interesting to see people feel like 
it, it is kind of like it feels like it takes a little bit of a risk, I guess, when you like outsource kind of the education and you have trust that this system is going to serve your family. And then when the system maybe isn't best serving your family and you're kind of reevaluating, I think it's, you know, unless you see an example. So maybe that's the benefit of you guys posting the other examples to kind of give people an idea in their head of what it could be apart from maybe the more limited picture we might have, you know, or I might've had before. Well, it's interesting that you say about the educational background, the educational credentials, and I don't want to be critical of anyone who has those. I think that's great. It's, it must be helpful, but what's been really interesting is that I actually have a child who has, you know, a learning issue. He has, um, he has, you know, it's really not, a a major problem, but, um, it does, you know, affect his ability, um, to learn at some time, at some points. And, um, I, I, I will tell you, um, I was intimidated when I started out, particularly because, uh, you know, that's the child that I would be homeschooling. And also because after years in the public school system, of being told, you know, this is what you should be, you should expect from your son. And this is what you should expect from, um, you know, him to accomplish. And, um, I thought that, and I think it had been beaten into me that I couldn't possibly help my son. And what's so interesting is, um, and I've told this story a couple times and (laughs) it still makes me very mad. But, um, when my son was very young, um, he has some issues with, with actually writing his thoughts down and I'm talking like with a pe- with a pencil and, I, and as it was yeah. explained to me and I think this is probably true of a lot of kids I don't think this is exactly just unique to him um but he just had racing thoughts and in trying to like organize those thoughts and then you and when a child is learning to use a pencil I mean we forget like it's actually hard like to to the mechanics of it and so he just has yeah. he would have a really hard time writing his letters down and organizing his thoughts and then he'd lose track of what he was saying anyway so he wasn't really a good writer and, or, and and like the mechanics of it. And I'll never forget when the, when the special ed, the, the sped teacher told me, just, just give up on it. Just give up on it, Julie, just give up on it. I'll never be a good writer. And she was so smug and dismissive. I mean, I had major meetings, the, the, the district I'm in, I'm in Alexandria city that the head of special ed had a meeting with me and like was so determined to get me to stop trying to get him like get the teachers to attend to this issue and finally I gave in because you know you you get beaten so much and you're so tired of hearing about it and they were telling me things like your focus of the on this is hurting him it's preventing him to progress oh. into other areas so they talked to me about all this um technology they have voice to text technology and I won't go into it but the point is is that I sort of gave up on that everyone did he was just typing and um but again, they don't they don't teach kids that young typing. So he was hunt and pecking instead of like being a fast yeah. typer. So it was just as frustrating. Anyway, bottom line, he's home. He's home for the first year. We're you know we we started obviously in September, and within um, just a few weeks, I saw amazing improvement in his writing. And because of because yeah. the curriculum that we chose, it's a classic. At, curriculum and he does he he is required in order to memorize to do a lot of memorization and so he just so it was the root like just over and over again writing the same thing over and over again and from then on I have been so resentful of what are called educational experts (laughs) and people with education I hear you (laughs) yeah I hear you yeah I hear you I think it I think I've I've noticed it's given people a little more confidence to take that Step because maybe it's a little less intimidating, but I don't think that makes you any more qualified to homeschool. Does that make sense? Yes, like it does. Maybe, I, yeah, I think people are just maybe a little more like you're a little less nervous to take the jump, but I think anybody should and could if your kid isn't being well served in the yeah. environment that they're in. And that's, you know, that's awesome to hear. On the radio, I just heard a story <laughs> yesterday about a daughter who's even parents had given up on her being able to read. And her sister was like, no, I'm going to teach you to read. And she did. And then she, you know, so part of that too is just where their parents. So it's like, I'm going to go the extra mile. I'm going to do the research to figure out my daughter that has a visual memory deficit. Like I'm going to do the extra research to be sure we have the best spelling differentiated program and know all, you know, 
the way yeah. because she's my kid. And so I believe in her, you know, so that's a well, good story. I think for I think, sharing. I, thanks, Allie. And, you know, all of these are really good stories. I've heard so many great stories and so many encouraging stories. And I hope that it really has a, a sort of opened up this possibility Ability. of homeschooling your children. And it's never too late. You know, I started homeschooling my son when he was entering the eighth grade. And I think that's kind of late for the, in, like, if you're, you know, if you're in the, in the, um, homeschool community and there are like there are big there's a big community of homeschoolers um sometimes people think that's too late I will always thank a woman from Memoria Press who helped me design this curriculum for my son because she kept saying it's not you know you're, he's gonna do great this is perfect we're just gonna help him catch up a little bit and I will tell you that was the other beauty of um of homeschooling was that my son definitely needed to catch up in certain subjects because he'd fallen a little bit behind and really the the quality of the education was not what we had wanted so we've been thinking about this for a long time so we actually helped we he reviewed um his sixth grade and seventh grade he's done like three years of math curriculum this in this one year. And part of that was review. And I think that's another thing, you know, one thing I wanted you to t touch on next is, is the reason my son was able to do all that math is because it really doesn't take that long. You know, you, I, I loved in your pandemic yeah. story, you talked about you, they, they learn in the morning and then they have a lot of time off to play and, and do what they want. Tell us about that. What's your day like? Yeah, well, I mean, it's different for my one that goes in the morning versus the afternoon. But basically, yeah. I, I do feel like the learning is so much more efficient. Like, even if you yeah. think about a math class, like how many questions kids have, or, you know, a lot of it's just in um, a lot of the day is transitions or, you know, even when they present, they have 25 presentations to get through as opposed to four, you know, so they yeah. just get through the material so much quicker and they also like the teacher knows that every student has really gotten it before they move on so it, it and they can go faster or slower depending on you know it's just so much more personalized and kind of customized to the kid and and the relationship with the teacher is stronger so they know um you know it just I feel like it's way more efficient so I, I definitely feel like they're learning more especially yeah. I mean the writing skills have so improved um and and, and just like even like annotating and note taking and things right. that just we hadn't she hadn't developed right. yet um but but it's a uh, yeah definitely I feel like in in half the amount of time they're learning more and then there's all this margin that we didn't have before so my daughter that had barely read for pleasure, you know, before um, COVID hit, then after COVID, I, I literally think she's read over a hundred books. I mean, she just discovered a love for reading. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah. It, it, and then that helps with, you know, obviously reading is amazing, but um, her typing has gone from like, she's discovered a, a nitro type game and she's gone from like 20 words per minute to in the nineties and her, oh, you know, wow. she just, there's more margin to yeah. do, you know, there's more time outdoor classes yeah. and more time. Yeah. More time. Yeah. You know, I, I want to, um, I want to pivot a little bit. It was interesting in your pandemic story, you talked about, you know, I, I mean, this is, this is related to the fact that the pandemic hit at the same time, uh, um, that the George Floyd, you know, the video of mm. George Floyd's death, um, came out at, which created, um, you know, obvious, um, horror and concern, um, throughout the country. And actually I you know, would say around the globe, um, and it, it happened at the same time. And so now you've, it's, it's created all the, I think a reaction among some schools, um, that is not helpful and, um, has brought politics. A lot of, um, schools now think that they need to bring more discussions of politics and what I think are issues um, best kept out of the schools and or taught in a way that's um, that's based in reality. <laughs> um, and I and so we saw a lot of what I would say the critical race theory stuff starting in our school, which is why we are unlikely to return to our public school. Um, um, it's not just because of the 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 great strides and that my child is thriving so much under homeschooling, but it's, um, it's also because I'm really concerned about what, um, 
how they're going to be taught um, in the public school. So I, you had a similar experience. Tell us a little bit about what you discovered um, when you checked on your public school's website. Yeah, I was getting emails from our superintendent um, at the, the time of the George Floyd protest. Um, and I, I went back after kind of things started to unfold in culture to see what was coming from my school district and what they were, because there was a recommended reading link that initially I didn't click on and probably most parents don't, to be honest. Um, right. But I, I, I clicked on it because I wanted to know what, what our school was putting out there for parents to read. Um, and it was just very politicized. Um, and, and definitely, I mean, put people in categories and groups based on skin color and described whole groups as a whole based on skin color. Um, and, and that's not how I view myself or, or my kids or how I want them to view other people. I just think like grouping people by immutable characteristics and describing those groups as a whole is going to cause and not prevent prejudice and bias and racism. So, um, yeah, I, I, I clicked on it. I emailed my superintendent very respectfully and, and asked, uh, it seems like teaching kids to be anti-racist is a high value to you. So how is that going to impact curriculum? And then he led me to recently adopted social justice standards and told me other ways that he was hoping to, to bring that into the classroom. Um, and the standards talk about that, that identity comes from groups you belong to and, and the way those groups intersect. And then it's just kind of furthered. I mean, they brought in a group to do an equity audit, like, you know, equal outcome as opposed to equal opportunity. And, um, and then they've formed a, a commission that will work with the equity group to, or the equity audit to give their recommendations. And, and some of it is the language is so like we all oppose racism. We right. All of course we do. Justice. <laughs> we, but, but it's like, but what is the method being employed to fight it? And that is not being clearly um, laid out for parents. And yeah. most of what I've discovered by doing a little bit of digging, parents still in the district are totally unaware of. Um, totally unaware. So I think yeah. that's, yeah. So that, I mean, that's something that obviously is a, is something that I, I don't want my kids to be taught. Um, but also, it, it's also, I mean, our, our school did a no place for hate. They want to be a no place for hate school and did a lesson on, you know, our school cares, you know, with the school name. Um, and it all sounds, who doesn't want to be a no place for hate? Like, who doesn't? Right. So then you click on that and it goes to the Anti-Defamation League. And then you click on their sample lessons and they're all politicized curriculum social justice poetry what is the electoral college should we get rid of it like all, you know it's just the so I when and when I asked my principal um she said you know this is the type of school we want to be and so maybe if this doesn't align with your worldview you might want to find a better spot so at least I mean they're yeah so that's that's where we're at but I I I think a lot of parents um, if you, if I hadn't dug and if I hadn't clicked on the links and then followed up with the superintendent and called my principal, I mean, I really wouldn't know right. what changes are being implemented or what's coming down the pipe. Well, there's two, I, I feel like there's two kinds of people um, in uh, sort of two kinds of parents. There's parent, first of all, every single parent, um, I mean, there, I mean, there is a, a teeny number of parents who don't want you know, things like, um, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, to kids to be taught about racism and, and, you know, America's history of slavery and, and Jim Crow and the continued discrimination of blacks, um, you know, in this country, Th these are things that, you know, I, I don't know. I literally don't know one person who objects to that, um, and to object yeah. to, to that being a part of the curriculum. You explained it, Really beautifully, Allie, I will tell you, it's really interesting to hear um, you talk about it because I, you really have a handle on what we're um, what we're looking at. And this is categorizing kids, making some feel, you know, bad for their color. Others feel like they are oppressors. Others feel like they are victims. It is a really um, sick way of looking at the world and it's very dangerous. And so mm -hmm. but I think, like you said, these things are often wrapped in this language of things like we want to fight racism, we want equality. And, and there's this confusion between equality and equity 
that a lot of people Mm -hmm. don't understand. It's very nuanced. And so, you know, I think also some parents, you know, after seeing what happened with the George Floyd, with the killing of George Floyd, you know, you just had people just felt, I think that a lot of people just felt terrible and thought, okay, we really need these programs, but they're not looking at the details like you are. Um, and they're not clicking on the links like you are and understanding that what they're, what is being te- taught is actually racism and it is a complete yeah. perversion of what needs to be taught. And these are children we're talking about that are being, you know, made to feel bad for immutable qualities, like you mentioned. So, um, I, I think that, it, you know, I've seen this too in my community where, people genuinely don't know. And then when they find out you've got two, you've got two courses. That's what I was talking about the two parents, like absolute terror, yeah. absolute terror to speak out. And, um, and then the folks who, I mean, I think there are some people who just actually believe in critical race theory and think that, you know, and, and frankly, I think a lot of people misunderstand what it is, but, um, but there, but there are some people who see this stuff and go, whoa, 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 this is, this does not <laughs> pass the smell check test and yet are really afraid to speak out. And, you know, we've kept your name. I think you're, what you're doing is entirely brave and, and coming on these shows, but do you feel a sense of nervousness of speaking out about your school and about, you know, maybe some policies that, that have been put in place? Well, I think pretty much the majority of parents near me do and not just parents. Um, um, I just, I mean, there's, there's kind of a feeling that you'll lose your job. You'll, um, if you don't agree with the method that is being implemented. Um, And even like, I'll just say, I I posted the social justice standards on next door. Very like, I I feel like I I try to be as risk. Yeah. Respectful (laughs) as possible. Like whether you like this or not, you could, you might not. But it's, you, you should know, you know, just because I had to dig to find it. And there have been curriculum standards that have changed. Um, so I just kind of wanted to bring that to, to attention. Um, and I got a lot of nasty messages. And then I kind of, after a day, like, oh, I'm going to take it down. And then I felt a little convicted. Like, look, I'm just, this is so objective. I'm just putting it there and let, you know, I have to get thicker skin. Like, it's no big deal. So then my husband's like, okay, put it back up, but take the comments off. So I'm like, okay. I, Cause he's like, you know, your heart is just to bring awareness. It's like, okay, I'll put it back up and take the comments off. Um, so the people did not like that I took the comments off. And within a day, my post had been removed um, by wow. next door admins. So that's what I also see happening is there's a lot of not even allowing the conversation to happen, um, yeah. which is so unfortunate because I found my neighbors that, we don't necessarily agree or politically, or we didn't vote the same way, but I've talked with a number of them just about the method being employed to fight something that everybody can agree, probably that racism. I don't think anybody, nobody I know at least that I've talked to values racism, but the method being employed, I think is something that uh, more people than, than we would think will agree is is off, you know, but, um, yeah. but well, I, I think, is, I, and one of the moms, one of the moms told me, she's like, gosh, the way you're explaining this, I, I like, I agree with what you're saying, but I'm very liberal, you know, but she, right. she's like, I, I don't think everybody know, like, I don't, I don't think everybody knows like what's being implemented. Well, so there's that's been a, what I, there's I think there's not everybody knows. A, there's also been a misuse of, uh, I mean, there really has been, I would say an overuse of a couple things, a couple words, racism, Nazism, uh, white supremacy. I mean, like, you know, everyone's a white supremacist if they, if they um, disagree with critical race. No, no, you're, you know, and so, so I think to some degree, um, words are, words don't have any meaning anymore. Um, you know, people, yeah. I mean, it doesn't care. Like I can, I was telling my, my 14 year old son, you know, in the, you know, when I was in college, you know, my early, in my early career, if someone had called me a racist, I would have changed. I, if I, if I, if someone had called me that, I, I would have been so unbelievably horrified because I think people didn't throw it around as much. I could be wrong. You know, maybe they were throwing around too much then, but yeah. I don't think so. And I mean, I, the weight of that word, the weight of that accusation was so heavy 
Whereas now it's like, gosh, you know, spend an hour on Twitter, you'll be called, you know, you'll be called yeah. a racist seven times, you know? So it just, it doesn't mean anything anymore. And, but, and yet there is such fear from people. And again, as you say, losing your yeah, job, by being, being you know, yes. Yeah. And I know, I, you know, I know people from real estate agents to insurance agents that, you know, to other people that are kind of in a, you know, in one of those sort of service industries where they, they rely on, it's like a sales kind of thing. They really have to be careful mm-hmm. about this stuff. Um, but this is what I think, you know, I, it's, you know, look, I understand the silence, but this silence and this intimidation and this sense that you can't even talk about something and yet you're supposed to send your kids to a school where they openly talk about this stuff, about things that are really dangerous and and really yeah. make children feel bad about their existence, their, their you know, and their, their the color of their skin. Um, this is going to drive more people to POTS, to homeschooling, to yeah. micro schools. Two yes. virtual schools. You know, one thing that I think has gotten a really bad name in this pandemic state that we're in is because public schools have done, I mean, not all of them. My public school has done a horrible job of pan, of, of virtual learning. It's all videos. It's all go do this. Don't go play this math game. It's horrible. My son has to navigate through, you know, tw- I counted it once. It was like he had to click, th- you know, 13 times in order to turn in uh, a, a project, which again was done entirely online. But there actually are some online schools that are really good. And I mentioned Memoria Press. Memoria Press um, has some online classes that are really well done. The teacher is interactive with the kids and walks them through assignments and really never leaves the classroom, the online classroom. Whereas mm-hmm. my child is put in his own Zoom room, like every 10 minutes, he's like sitting there by himself. And so, there are this this what we're seeing out there this really is a revolution people are going to start to say you know i want to do this on my own and for people like you and me who have the finances to do this there are people that don't that are going to start demanding more choice and yeah. i think we're going to see some real exciting things happening in the educational space in the next couple of years and it, i, I really can't, hope so i can't understand and I mean, and maybe you know, but the argument against school choice, I'm like, I feel I like everybody should have this opportunity. If the yeah. money followed the kid, then it gives, I mean, competition in the marketplace. Like that's right. why private schools are like, I have to open or we'll close. Like, right. you, you know, there's some, we have to attract, we have to offer things. Yes. And yeah. what's, so yes. what's so interesting, what's so interesting, what's so interesting about the argument against when they say, well, if you give if you give the money to families instead of institutions, which is sort of the whole school choice argument, um, then okay. then you'll rob public schools of their funding. And I love this line of questioning because you then you go, why, why, why would it rob? And the person has to say, well, because people they're will doing leave. a good job. They well, go. but, but yeah. why will? But then you say, but why will they leave? And the, the, I mean, the only reason yeah. people would leave a public school is because it's not performing well, just like any other business. And so like, if I go to a store and I don't like the service I'm getting, I don't go back to that store. And so so yeah. you, I love that argument because it always shows that what they don't want is competition. The public schools want the money so that they they that it's a guarantee that people cannot leave. And what's so horrible is nobody is trapped in public schools except people who can't afford to get out and that is those are the most vulnerable kids the ones that ostensibly these liberals are saying they care about so it is it is really galling i know and um and i really think that stories like yours ali are going to encourage more people to leave and hopefully will encourage more people to see that we need to give people choice in the marketplace and when it comes to education yeah amen well, listen, uh, I feel like that was like a little Tuttle twin ending there, you know. Um, uh, Allie, you are just a, a great guest, and I'm really uh, thrilled that you came on to talk about, um, I think, what's a really exciting time probably in both of our lives um, and, a, and, and a yeah. real benefit to your kids. So thanks so much for coming on. Thanks again for having me. I love these stories. I love all of these stories about what people have done creatively um, in this time, in this really, you know, uh, difficult time 
I think the the shutdowns um, and and COVID has have been a very difficult time for people. But out of it has come some really inspiring stories of people taking control of their children's education and and finding creative ways um, to keep their kids going. And Allie's story is certainly an inspiration. Um, Allie's pandemic learning story uh, can be found at IWF. Dot org. So check that out if you want to read more about what she has done um, to ensure her children are doing well during the school shutdowns. Thanks, everyone, for being here for another episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. If you enjoyed this episode or like the podcast in general, please leave a rating or review on iTunes. This helps ensure that the podcast reaches as many listeners as possible. If you haven't subscribed to the Bespoke Parenting Hour on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play or wherever you get your podcasts, please do so so you won't miss an episode. Don't forget to share this episode and let your friends know that they can get bespoke episodes on their favorite podcast app. From all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.